Hello and welcome to a socially distanced reboot of our series in the Faculty Lounge. I'm Paul Houtman, Dean of the UT Graduate School of Medicine, and obviously we're not in the Faculty Lounge today. We're at the Center for Advanced Medical Simulation at the University of Tennessee, and I'm joined today by a special guest, Dr. Leo Lampson an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine, an emergency room physician, and the director of our Center for Advanced Medical Simulation. Leo, welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. So before we get into the details about our Sim Center, what we often like to do in the faculty lounge is to talk about uh, our physicians and their careers and how they reached uh, this particular point in time. So I note that uh, you spend a lot of time in Michigan and attended Wayne State University both for undergraduate and master's degree, and then opted to go into medicine and also got your medical degree from Wayne State. So tell me a little bit about your decision to, to go into medicine, and then we'll explore the decision to uh, move into medical simulation. Well, um, my I guess one of my one of my interests uh, before medicine was just uh, I like to work on cars, and I was thought that maybe I could uh, build race cars for a living, but that didn't seem seem like a good good investment in time. So, um, so it so came medicine came along medicine, which I think has a lot of parallels with with uh, the human body has a lot of parallels with cars, but and uh, is a lot more for, more a lot more uh, worthwhile to work on than a car. So you, you proceeded uh, on this campus to uh, complete a residency in family medicine and then a certificate program in emergency medicine, um, and then spent two years, uh, as if that wasn't enough training, two years uh, in uh, the Sim Center as a fellow, uh, and you've gone on also to uh, obtain advanced studies in uh, education in a formal way at the university. So tell us a little bit about that transition from uh, family physician to uh, your major focus now, which is uh, medical simulation. So yeah, I, so I currently I, I'm currently one of the emergency physicians here, and um, I took a more non-traditional route uh, through family medicine with a with a fellowship program. And I, when I became program director of our fellowship program, emergency medicine fellowship program, one of my fellows asked me, "Hey, can we use the Sim Center?" and by that time, this, when I was a resident, the Sim Center had just started, so uh, uh, not many people knew about it. And when my fellow asked me, I could let me go find out. And so when I came down to the Sim Center one day, I ran into Melinda and Judy, and I, I asked them, hey, can we use it for our emergency medicine fellowship? They gave me a tour, and I think I was there for the whole afternoon. Uh, but I was so excited to start start utilizing simulation. And what, what became Two, maybe two times a year became uh, every other month, and then before I knew it, I was in the Sim Center every few every few uh, every few days. Um, and then when the opportunity arrived, and there was, I found out that there was a fellowship in medical education and simulation here. Uh, you know, get to, getting to work with Melinda and Judy, I, I, it was just a no-brainer that that uh, that I should I should do the fellowship. And you know, I, I was fortunate enough that I have a very supportive family that would allow me to do that. Wonderful. So uh, let, let's take a step back and really talk about um, the history of medical simulation. I mean, it has become a major part of how we train not just our medical students, but our residents and uh, even our, our full-fledged attending physicians uh, on, uh, on new techniques, uh, new procedures. Um, when did this really take off in the United States as a major component, component of medical education? Yeah, I think uh, starting in the early 2000s is when it really started to to gain gain uh, gain momentum, and it's just been going on since then. Um, I think with with uh, with uh, there was a there was a paper that came out uh, called "To To Air Is Human," and which talked about patient safety and uh, proposed simulation as a as a as a solution to uh, to help increase patient safety. I think that's when uh, medical simulation really took off. And we've seen a huge growth of medical simulation here on this campus. Tell us a little bit about uh, the accreditation that we have through the American College of Surgeons. Yeah, so um, so our, our our simulation center is is uh, accredited by the American College of Surgeons, which which means that we we are uh, a leader with surgical education. And not only that, uh, you know, it, it it brings us into a a, a group where. Uh, we can collaborate. We have areas that we can collaborate with, institutions that we can collaborate with, and really be be the leaders in surgical education. 
So give us an idea about the volume. I know you, you're very busy, especially at, at, the, at the beginning of the academic year, but really throughout the year in training uh, a whole host of individuals. I mean, and it's not just the, the physicians, it's nurses, it's team, a lot of teamwork, uh, team building and so forth. Do you have some idea about the number of individuals who on this campus will take advantage of the simulation center in the course of an average year? Um, with exact numbers, I think they're along the lines of well, I think most most residency programs will find will find their residents go through here at some point during their training, but probably around three thousand a year, or just over three thousand patient uh, uh, learner encounters per year. And maybe you can just give us also a brief run through of the type of simulations that we do typically, and then. Uh, Dr. Lampson is going to take us on a tour of the Sim Center uh, to give us some idea about our facilities uh, and the type of simulations that we actually do. Uh, so there's, you know, simulation is so is so broad. Uh, one, of the, for one of the things that we we offer our task specific task trainers. I think one of the one of the most used task trainers is our central line trainer, Sim Man. Uh, we also have task trainers for multiple procedures such as lumbar puncture, uh, thoracentesis, paracentesis. We have box trainers where our, our surgeon, surgeons in training can practice their laparoscopic skills. We, we also have some, some high fidelity task trainers like our angio mentor, our, our vascular mentor, and as well as our ultrasound trainer, which, which I can, uh, will be able to show everyone later. You know, I think one thing, one issue that is not frequently discussed, but I think is very, very important, is that uh, maintaining a sim center, let alone uh, expanding it, is a very expensive uh, proposition. The software, the licensing, um, sim man, sim woman, and so forth um, are uh, very expensive. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, that um, I, I think that's a problem that's shared throughout the country. Um, financing sim centers uh, takes a lot of funding. We're absolutely committed to it here on this campus because it's such a vital part of, of medical education. Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, and that's that's a that's a that's a big issue in the sim world right now. Is how can you show that return on investment? I think one of the places where it's been shown in the literature is is with central line training. Uh, there's a group out of Northwestern that is, has showed that by adopting a central line training program for their residents there, they were able to decrease collapsing rates and save hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. And that, that the cost of starting that program was just over $100,000, but uh, with the number of collapses that they were able to decrease, um, save them over uh, just around $800,000. So it was, a, it was definitely a return on investment, a good re return on investment for them. And, uh, and that's one of our, I guess that's one of the things that we're trying to show in simulation right now is how can we de demonstrate that return on investment. I think our learners like to use simulation. Our faculty would love to use simulation more as an educational tool. It's, you know, just being able to show that return on investment. Is. And showing that return on investment also means research. And uh, tell us something about some of the research ideas that you have for the Sim Center. Yeah, you know, especially in the in the day and age of uh, competency based medical education, we have uh, the ACGME milestones. We have entrustable uh, professional uh, activities. I think. As, uh, as, as we move forward with those things, I think simulation will be a greater part of that picture. And, um, and that also goes, that, that ties in the research in that, um, you know, simulation has, has been shown to increase confidence of our learners, increase the, uh, the skill of our learners, and uh, it'll be one way to demonstrate competency in the future. One of the research projects that we're that we have right going on right now is, you know, can we demonstrate uh, the difference between novice and expertise in performing medical procedures using mobile EEG devices or portable EEG devices? Uh, we also have another research project that looks at, you know, using different assessment tools to um, to perform different procedures such as suturing. Well, that's really fascinating. I want to thank you for uh, joining us today, and we look forward to your mini tour. Uh, if uh, individuals uh, listening in are, are interested in, in learning more, you can visit us at our website with the, the University of Tennessee Center for Advanced Medical Simulation. And uh, in the meantime, we are also looking forward to revitalizing in the faculty lounge and uh, encouraging other very accomplished faculty members to, to join me in a discussion about their areas of expertise. So until next time, we thank you for joining us. Thank you.
Hey, thank you for joining me in the Sim Center today. Um, this is our GI Bronc Mentor. So our learners can practice uh, EGD, colonoscopy, as well as bronchoscopy. So this is our ultrasound trainer, and this is probably the most utilized trainer that we have in the Sim Center. And with this, residents can learn how to use ultrasound. Uh, they, we have modules that teach cardiac exam, the rush and fast exam, how to look into the abdomen, and how to look into the lungs. Uh, we also have a TEE trainer to, for anyone that wants to learn that kind of ultrasound. So the, this is our box trainer, and when the surgery residents can find time in their busy schedule, this is what they used to practice. I know when I was a resident and tried to assist with laparoscopic surgeries, I didn't know how people became so proficient, and it's uh, because they were able to use medical simulation to practice. So this is Simman 3G. He's one of our high fidelity mannequins. We can run case scenarios of cardiac arrest and many different other clinical events. Um, but he has his own breath sounds. He has his own heart sounds. He has pulses or absence of pulses. He can blink. His pupils can constrict. We can start him on life support, and we can also give him some electricity if he if he goes into cardiac arrest. And this is all controlled from our control room by someone on a computer. So this is Sim Newby. He's, he's another one of our high fidelity mannequins. Just like Sim Man, we can do a lot of different case scenarios where we simulate uh, newborn resuscitation. Uh, and we can also uh, practice physical examination skills with Sim Newby. So this is a typical exam room that we have here where, where medical students and residents can practice just basic clinical skills, uh, interviewing, and physical exam.